Hey guys, so I'm going to have to apologise, my voice is killing me. No idea what next week's Crusader video is going to sound like. Probably like this, to be honest. Um, I've got a cold, can't help it. But um, today, I'm going to answer a bunch of questions from my patrons who support me uh, with $5 or more a month. And it's all about the North African campaign, or the Middle East, or the Mediterranean sort of thing. Relying on books like this one, which I've purchased specifically to answer these, uh, these questions. So, let's crack on with it. Sweden420 writes, You have made it clear in your previous videos the importance of supplies in the North African campaign. I've often heard Malta described as the linchpin of the whole Mediterranean campaign. If lost, the British would have lost the ability to attack Axis convoys with subs and aircraft, while at the same time reducing their own ability to bring supplies into Egypt without going around the Cape of Good Hope. Is this the case, or is Malta's value as a base overstated? and the Axis decided it wasn't a priority. I've heard at the start of hostilities the island was nearly defenceless. What were the reasons the Italians and later the Germans failed to carry out an operation to take Malta? Would the taking of Malta had any significant impact on the North African campaign? Malta has a very important role to play in World War II. Was it the linchpin? That's up for debate, but actually when you look at the North African campaign, um, the way that the campaign progresses is directly related to how much or how well Malta was doing at that particular moment in time. So when Malta does well and is doing okay economically, etc., and is getting supplied, then Rommel is suffering from supply issues in North Africa. So it's directly related. So when you look at a map of the Mediterranean, and you see that Malta is just below Sicily and kind of in between Sicily and um, Tripoli, which is the main Axis port. And we'll get back to that. You can see how actually not taking the island means that the Axis are having to go straight through, you know, British waters, basically. And even later on, when you've got the Tunisian campaign, it's pretty easy if the British have got a base near, uh, you know, between... Tunis and Italy slash Sicily, it, you know, Malta's proximity to that is very, very close, allowing the British to actually engage Axis supply routes in that area on the sea, but also in the air as well. Now, according to Levine, the port of Tripoli was the largest port in the Axis North Africa in Libya, and was often the only one open to the Axis. He says it could handle only 45,000 tons a month, and was far from the front, which it is. If you look at it, it's miles to the west. Benghazi's maximum capacity was 2,700 tons a month, and Tobruk was just 2,000 tons a month. So Tobruk and Benghazi and other ports like that, there are a few other ports around that area, Bardia for one, these guys are tiny compared to what Tripoli was. Tripoli was massive in that in that sense. So Tripoli was vital to the Axis prior to um, you know the the torch landings in the West. So Malta's proximity to Tunis has the potential to actually block or at least harass and interdict those supply lines. Definitely at the start of the offensive, the island was. Uh, you could say basically defenseless. They had some old biplanes in a box, apparently. Again, Levine says, um, surrounded by enemy bases, it had been written off as untenable. In mid-1940, the small garrison had few anti-aircraft guns. A few old biplane fighters in crates had been left on Malta by mistake. And also, they only had a handful of anti-aircraft guns. The reason was because the British didn't really see the value of the island. They thought it would just fall in like a matter of days. They didn't think it would last very long um, prior to the war. What happened was Churchill came along and went, no, no, we're going to hold on. I think his idea generally was to just, we'll just fight them everywhere. Like we'll fight them on the beaches, we'll fight them on the landing grounds, we'll fight them everywhere, including on Malta. So he kind of reversed British strategy there and made Malta more important. Levine actually says, like, um, I'll quote it, the Germans and Italians could not launch an offensive unless Malta's threat to the supply lines was at least temporarily suppressed. So, 
It may or may not have been the linchpin, but it was definitely important and directly impacted the campaign. The at first the air bases weren't too you know well set up, and they only had old fighters anyway. So it was actually I think a couple of submarines, two submarines um, that were able to actually do a lot of damage at the beginning. The submarines apparently sank three of Italy's largest troop transports um, in the August and September 1941. They also started interdicting um, ships, mainly from mid-1941 onwards. It got to the point where, as I said in the Crusader videos, uh, and I'll quote Levine here, from mid-October 1941, the Italians began carrying troops almost exclusively in destroyers, an expensive practice that at least ensured that they actually reached Libya. This is very much... Uh, supported by other evidence that I've already talked about in the um, Crusader series because, yeah, they were using warships. I think I said battleships in the video. I meant to say warships. It's actually warships. Uh, somebody pointed that out to me. And what happens there, this is in middle of 1941, you know, August, September. By, um, by mid-1941, the average... Sorry, through, through July to October... 1941, the average Italian um, shipping losses of supplies was 16%. And then after that, it shot up to 62% uh, up until January 1942. So 60, 62% of cargo was sunk in the Mediterranean basically between October and January 1942. So throughout the winter. So during the, the Crusader, Crusader period, Rommel's got no supplies coming in, effectively. Um, and then from January 1942 on, onwards, that's when the Malta siege really begins. And, it, and um, Levine says over 400 Axis planes based on Sicily attacked day after day. And so you have what he refers to as the Malta Blitz, whether that's actually the official term or not. And as a result of that, between Jan January and May 1942, only 6% of supplies dropped. So it went from 16% originally to uh, to a massive 62% and then down to 6%. And you can see how it impacts it. 16% when Rommel is able to counterattack and get to Tobruk. Once he's at the Tobruk area, uh, Malta kind of picks up and 62% and of supplies drop, at which point the Allies are able to win in uh, Crusader. And then after Crusader, between January and May 1942, when you've got the Gazala and all these other battles going on, uh, Rommel's second offensive, etc., only 6% of supplies are sunk. So again, it, it has that impact. It's interwoven between the two. What, what Malta does impacts directly the North African campaign. However, uh, Levine also says only 6% of Axis supplies had been lost en route to Africa in July, but what arrived was still not enough to keep Rommel properly supp supplied. And this is this is very much true because people are like, oh yeah, the Axis should have a North African you know, campaign. They should have focused in North Africa. They couldn't supply Rommel as he was. They couldn't supply him as he was. So what chance have they got of, you know, sending an entire army group south? Like, it's not, it's not possible. Rommel's really not got enough supplies. The ports of Tripoli do not allow... Um, sorry, the, the ports in North Africa do not allow the Axis to supply their own troops. So they haven't... And, and that's with the troops they've got. So they've got no chance. He also goes on to say that the Maltanese were starving during this period. Um, they were on a diet that spelled slow starvation. For months, they had lived on 1,200 to 1,500 calories a day. And now rations were cut again. Basically, he says that the, the British had to try and get a convoy through because if they didn't, uh, Malta would have surrendered at the end of the first weekends of September 1942. So those calorie intakes, the, that's pretty much similar to what the Germans were starving in Stalingrad with, um, sort of. And obviously, it got worse as the, as the siege went on in Stalingrad, but you get it. Basically, what happens is the the... British try and send a convoy from Egypt and aren't able to get through. And then they have no choice but to get a convoy through from the west, from G uh, Gibraltar area. And only, I think it's five ships managed to get through. And uh, some of them were barely, you know, 
it, one of them's getting towed into the harbor and the other ones are barely like alive um so malta only just about holds on um which is lucky for the british because then this impacts what's going on with rommel so going from six percent of supplies getting sunk in july by august 1942 a third of all rommel supplies and 41% of his fuel had been lost en route to Africa. So again, we're getting, you know, it, Malta's kind of picking up again, and it's directly impacting the campaign. How much it's, it is Malta on its own is, is up to, for debate, though, because um, the British are also, you know, hitting him. The American Air Force is in uh, position now, and I don't think they're based on Malta. So it's clearly, it's not just Malta on its own. And, and Levine even says no fuel reached Libya in the first week of October because of an air submarine victory off Greece, which, you know, if it's in Greece or near Greece, it's not going to be from Malta. Rommel then loses 20% of his supplies en route to Africa in September and no less than 44% in October as he retreated through Libya, losses remaining high. So I, I think going off your question, you know, was it the linchpin of the whole campaign? I'm not sure if I can actually answer that uh, right now, because I think I'd have to do a lot more research on it. But is it the case that uh, vol uh, Malta's value as a base was overstated? I don't think so, because it wouldn't. if it was overstated, it wouldn't impact the campaign as directly as it did. So when Malta does well, Rommel doesn't, you know. And when Malta does bad, Rommel does well. So clearly... It has its part to play. Was it the linchpin? That's up to you to decide. But, I th in, you know, going off what I've read with Levine, it seems like if the Germans had taken Malta, you're talking, you know, at least, or at the very least, you know, tens of percentages extra of supplies per month. That's quite a significant increase. And, uh, you know, it would have impacted campaign, you know, uh, battles like El Alamein if Rommel had received, let's say, 20-30% extra supplies. That's quite a lot. And, you know, you've got to think, well, yeah, that probably would have impacted that. And it may have meant that he wouldn't have retreated as far either. So the stated reason why the Italians and the Germans didn't actually take Malta, even though we've seen it is quite important, um, the reason is because they decide, okay, we're going to do this, but we're going to, it's going to take a few months to get our guys ready to do it. Okay, so in the meantime, we'll just starve Malta out. So this, this is where the siege comes in. So it's, I think it's like the April 1942 when they decide, well, right, we are going to do this. But what happens is Rommel does really well in North Africa. He wins at Gazala and Malta's starving. So it's kind of like, well, why would we risk this massive campaign of, you know, landing on the island if the island's now been suppressed enough and is barely hanging on and it's not really impacting the campaign at the minute. We may as well not do it. That's the reason why they go, actually, there's no point doing it now. We've, we've pretty much won. We're going to win, you know, as, it, as Levine says, they're going to starve it out by September. We may as well just starve it out and save the uh, landing forces because uh, Hitler's not, um, he's not convinced that the Italians will actually land and do it properly. And he thinks it'll be heavy casualties, not just for the Italians, but also for the, the uh, Volksmaker. And he's a little bit reluctant to commit the Volksmaker after Crete. So he's quite happy to just starve them out. And then what happens is that convoy gets through. So the reason Malta isn't, the Germans and the Italians don't take Malta is because they're reluctant to take it. Um, they may as well just starve it out. And then the siege of Malta actually fails and only just about fails. So that's the reason why. So I hope that answers your question. So Torin Palmer says, Tick, you have talked a lot about the North African campaign and made some fantastic videos on it. In your opinion though, how important or how big of a role did the Middle East campaign against Vichy, France, Iraq and Iran play during the war? So looking at the 1940-41 to 41 era, that's really when Vichy, France, Iraq, Iran these places actually um, are important. Wavell in the Middle East, he's in command of the whole of the Middle East. He's basically fighting, at one point, he's fighting five campaigns at once. So he's fighting in North Africa. He's fighting in uh, East Africa. He's fighting in Iraq. He's fighting in Iran. He's fighting in, he's just fighting all over the place. He's fighting in Greece. He's fighting all over the place. Um, so this was a, a dilution of British strength. 
after, broadly speaking, after all these other places had been taken and secured and whatever, then more resources start going towards North Africa. So, in a sense, these were more diversionary options. They were never really, I don't think Vichy France in Syria, for example, would really be able to hold on. Um, East Africa, Italy is isolated there and it's slowly getting crushed. And uh, Iraq and Iran, these places aren't really going to hold up against either the Soviets or, or the British. So they are more diversionary, small operations, really. But when you look at the North African campaign in 1940 to 41, these dilute British strength away from the North African campaign, uh, giving Rommel and the Italians a chance of victory. And really, I would probably say that once these places have been sorted out, really in the Orkinlek era, then the fortunes or the chance of Rommel and the Italians actually winning in North Africa get kind of, it kind of dives. There is still a chance, but they've got a, the best chance then because once these areas are taken by the British uh, and then the Soviets in Iraq, uh, Iran, more resources can be thrown at Rommel in North Africa. So they've really got a very small time period to actually win it. And uh, most of these are kind of done by the end of 1941. So really, by the time you get to 1942, yes, Rommel is winning these tactical victories and operational victories in North Africa, but he's not. He's The strategic situation has changed. Now North Africa is the focus of the British intentions. So when you, Eighth Army kind of grows in strength, um, and as a result, the Axis kind of have to grow in strength in North Africa, which is always a problem because logistically they can't supply them. Again, the Malta situation. So it, it really, in my opinion, they were actually quite important because they diluted British strength, allowing the Axis a chance to win. But unfortunately, they weren't able to seize that chance. Alex asks, how would taking Cairo have impacted the outcome of the war? Would the Axis have been able to exploit the oil fields in Egypt and Iraq? Or would the Allies have been able to at least defend the Iraqi ones? Would this have brought Iran into the war on the Axis side? What other impacts might it have had? This is somewhat related to what Kevin asked. Um, after watching the Crusader videos a few times, there is a mention of Axis supply issues for replacement gear, ammo, fuel, particularly with shipping limitations across the Mediterranean. This is coupled with a general oil shortage across the board. The British, on the other hand, seem to have no issues finding fuel for tens of thousands of lorries, more trucks than the Axis, and the supply chain that keeps it all going. Question 1. Where did the fuel for the British desert gear come from? 2. What would the theoretical fuel supply limit have been? 3. What, if any, impact did the apparent availability of fuel have on the British decision to make Africa a key focus over any other available or potential theater of war against the Axis. Okay, so looking at a map from Taprani's PhD, um, he shows that there's an oil field and a refinery in Egypt. But beyond that, the nearest oil fields are actually in Iraq and uh, Basra and Iran. So there's a little bit of oil in Egypt, but it's tiny. Um, there's two refineries in Lebanon uh, and uh, the Palestine area. But beyond that, everything is centered in Iraq and Iran. And going off another map, uh, it clearly shows that what's coming out of Egypt is basically nothing. Um, the Middle East is getting, you know, exporting a lot of stuff, but uh, Egypt itself is not. So most of the oil in the Middle East at this time is coming from Iran and Iraq. Taprani also says that uh, by the eve of the Second World War, besides being the world's largest exporter, Venezuela was also Britain's most important oil supplier, providing 39% of its imports in 1937, which was 4,422,000 tons out of uh, 11,249,000 tons production. And he says that uh, during wartime, Venezuela would actually supply the British Empire um, with a lot more than that because um, production was increased. But he also says that once the war began, Venezuela was eclipsed by the United States as Britain's most important supplier because Venezuelan crude 
uh, was not as suitable as US oil for being refined into high oct octane gasoline. And he also says, nonetheless, Venezuela was an indispensable supplier once Iran stopped exporting west of Suez after 1940. Now, I'm not entirely sure why, but it appears that Britain didn't have a lot of oil tankers to spare. And as a result of tanker losses, um, Taprani says in the second half of 1940, this forced Britain to embrace the principle of the short haul, um, which he says then ended uh, uh, Iran's exports to Britain even before the Anglo invasion um, and, he, and he quotes 1,526,000 tons in 1940 to only 324,000 tons in, in August 1941 and, uh, and rendered Middle Eastern oil, um, basically North Africa, beyond North Africa, the, the oil couldn't go to Britain. In the footnotes, he, he quotes from a book and he says, uh, in fact, the British needed to compensate the Iranians for the Anglo-Iranian oil company's reduced take offtake after 1940 due to the implementation of the short haul policy after May 1940 to save tanker tonnage after Italy closed access through the Mediterranean. So Taprani's not actually saying where the oil is coming from in the Middle East. He doesn't even mention the, um, the campaigns there, and none of my other books really talk about it. So it's a bit of an educated guess, but given the tanker situation, it does sound like a lot of the oil is coming from uh, Iran and Iraq, which is why the British perhaps wanted to secure both those countries quite quickly uh, in, in 1941. And maybe some of the oil is later coming from the United States, etc., uh, Venezuela. Um, but it appears that with uh, the Italians blocking the Mediterranean, it makes a lot of sense and and the British not having much tanker capacity makes a lot of sense for most of the oil in the Middle East, you know, most of the oil in North Africa to come from the Middle East. Um, I would suspect that's the case, given the maps and given the information I've got at the minute. But if I find anything else, you know, that contradicts this, I will come back to it. So to answer the question, you know, how, how would taking care of impact the outcome of the whole war? Probably not a lot. Um, it may have allowed the Axis to supply... Um, the Africa core with oil, but that's about it. It's not going to, it's not going to provide them with tons of supplies. But obviously the oil situation would have been a little bit better had they taken the Egyptian oil fields. But the thing is, getting to Cairo in itself is not enough. You'd have to go further south to those oil fields and, and the refinery, etc. And that's assuming the British don't blow it up, which is potentially what could happen. So I'm not convinced that that would have actually changed the outcome of the war. Now, could they have got the, the British accidentally not blow up the oil fields? And then, um, could they have explo ex you know, the Axis exploited them? Of course. But you've only got one oil field, as far as I'm aware, and one, um, refinery in Egypt. That's not going to be enough. You're going to have to go all the way to Iran and Iraq. And then you've got the ninth army with Mil Wilson there. And, uh, assuming eighth army is not destroyed at this point, it's, you, you, <sighs> You're a long way off. You're a long way off. And there's, and not being able to supply the axis as it is, it's, it's just not, I can't see it happening. I really can't. They'd have to get, they'd have to destroy the eighth army, walk through every single port, uh, solve the situation in the Mediterranean. It, it's just so much going on. They would have had to take Malta as well. I don't know. I don't know. Uh, would it have brought Iran in on the war of the Axis side? Well, Iran was, Iran crumbled in about four seconds anyway, so I don't think that would have actually really impacted anything. Um, cause don't forget Iran was conquered in World War II by Axis, uh, by the, uh, Soviets and the British. So again, that's not really going to impact them much. So I don't think, maybe if they'd have taken Egypt, this might have improved the situation in North Africa, but you, there's so much, you know, it's not going to improve the oil situation at the very least because the oil fields in Egypt weren't enough. You'd have to go all the way, all the way to Iraq and, and Iran. And I don't think Rommel could have done that, nor the Italians, if I'm honest. What would the theoretical supply limit have been? So in 40 uh, and 41, when O'Connor's fighting, they struggle to get to the coast south of Benghazi. Like they, they barely make it. Um, 
It probably could have gone a, bit, a little bit further. O'Connor's wanting to go to Tripoli. Would that have been a viable conquest or not? It, we're talking hypothetical now. I, I don't actually know. Um, Rommel counterattacks. Then you get the whole situation at a battle axe, brevity, uh, crusader. And in, in Crusader as well, what they do is they extend the railway line up until just south of ben, uh, City Barani. And then you've got the Oasis Force and you've got the whole of the Crusader operation going on. But the Oasis Force goes across the desert and, again, struggles to get to the coast south of Benghazi, kind of like um, what O'Connor does, although that was it's much further south. The Oasis group and the Long Range Desert group, they're raiding the coast, but they're not actually able to do a lot more. They can't physically physically go any further Be- and this is only a small force and this is this is because of the distances required so trucks and, and yeah they're not really the priority but it's a small force you think they would be able to supply themselves trucks long range desert group vehicles so on and so forth these guys are struggling so the 8th army as a whole is going to struggle and I don't want to really want to spoil it but I'm going to a little bit 8th um, army does reach the area and they are they, again. They are really, you know. You can see. You can see that, that they are. Even though Rommel has his forces are kind of depleted at this point, you can definitely see that the you know the British Eighth Army is struggling to to get to. Um, well, I can't remember the name is uh, uh, Mercer Brega and, and that area, Elagala, that area. They're really kind of struggling to get. And then this is perhaps why the, the Rommel's able to counterattack again. And, and this is his second offensive. I would probably say that until the railway is extended, um, and I think it is later on, that that is theoretically the limit of the British advance. So for this time, once more trucks come available, once Len Lease is coming in, uh, once Montgomery's in, and so on and so forth, maybe the situation has changed. I haven't looked that far ahead, but certainly 40, 41, and early 42, the British can barely get to Elagala before their supply situation is bad. And I suspect it's a lack of trucks overall, um, maybe not a lack, lack of trucks in general, but a lack of trucks overall to supply that force going that far. And also the the, uh, the railway line going to City Barani. There's also an issue with Crusader and the counterattack with Rommel, um, because Halfaya Pass is still held by the frontier garrisons, but that goes away prior to Rommel's counteroffensive. So uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm looking to the future. I haven't seen it yet. Uh, I haven't read read up post Crusader yet. I want to, but I'm going to have to leave it for now. Um, but I suspect that's the reason why. I don't think it was an impact because. What when you? I think I've covered this in Crusader actually. Um, Brit, the British weren't really able to attack the main continent. They weren't able to get into Europe, really. Uh, there's Dieppe raid and so on, but and and Bruneville, but the, they're just minor operations. The the reality is that the British have no chance of actually landing a, a significant force on the European mainland, so they can't attack them that way. Um, they're not really getting threatened by Germany anymore because of Operation Barbarossa. They're going east. The, the Axis are going east. They, they've been thrown out of Greece. Um, what other option is there? The only option really is, if you're tackling Germany, um, either fight on the Eastern Front, which the Soviets don't seem to allow, uh, or uh, fight in North Africa. That's the only other front available. So... I don't think fuel really came into this decision. I think it was just literally looking at the strategic situation going, this is our only front. We need to attack. Yeah, obviously the Syria and so on and Iran, but we, they'll sort them out and then they'll, t- they'll focus on North Africa. And that's kind of the decision made. And I don't think fuel really was an impact on that decision. Final question from Alex again. How was Turkey so easily able to stay out of the war with a massive superpower on every border, especially considering it was one of the most strategically important positions in the world at the time? Under what circumstances would it have joined any side and what impact would it have made had it done so? If you've got three superpowers on either sort of, like it's kind of like a Y shape, you've got the British below, the Soviets that way, and the Axis that way. Um... I mean, no matter what happens with Turkey, like, 
if one of them attacks, you open up an entire new front. So really, the, the Germans... Potentially, the Germans could have invaded Turkey in 1941 prior to the invasion of the Soviet Union, but then that would have just been red flag for the Soviet Union. Um, I'm not sure if there was a clause in the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, but I suspect that Turkey would have remained neutral because the Soviets tend to always want the the Turks to kind of remain too neutral because that guards the Dardanelles, which gets to um, Sevastopol, etc. So I, I don't think... The Soviets would have wanted that unless they invaded it themselves. But again, if they invade it, then, I mean, that then brings the British in because the British are like, no, no, why is Turkey... Like, Turkey is a neutral country for a good reason because it's right. It's smack bang in the middle. That's that's actually easy. To the Turks, I assume, because I haven't actually looked at it, but it, think about it. They could exploit one another. Oh, oh, the Soviets are pushing for, I don't know, invasion. Well, I'll go and ally myself with the Brits or the... Uh, the Germans, or, oh, the Germans are attacking, okay, well, I'll allow myself with the, so, it, to, to, Turkey's actually kind of in a, a good position there, because they've, they've got three choices of who they, you know, they can get support from, and not only that, it's kind of, I mean, if you've ever been to Turkey, it's quite a hilly country, so a Blitzkrieg type offensive is going to be not ideal, um, especially since you'll have to get across the Dardanelles, so it's not really a great position for the Axis to attack. We've seen what's happened in World War One when it comes to invading Turkey from, uh, well, any direction, uh, from from the Caucasus and or from the South and the Brits. So you've really got a position where strategic, it's, it's strategically it's quite hard to invade Turkey unless you've got a concerted effort. Resources are, are stretched for everybody at this moment in time. Germany's already committed. Well, Hitler's already committed to going to the east, so he's committed there. The Brit, the British, has kind of spread out across the Mediterranean. They can't open another front in Turkey. The Soviets certainly can't once the uh, Germans get involved. So it kind of really, it's a very easy position, I think, for the Turks. Really, the only only other thing is, and I said this in the far blind video, the Turkish once the. Uh, Germans were into the Caucasus, there was talk about Turkey joining the Axis. And whether that would have happened or not, we'd have to look into Turkish, um, the military situation. But it was, it was talked about. It was, it was almost happening. So it's a case of if, if the Germans had won in the Caucasus, maybe the Turkish would have joined with the, um, with the Germans. But that's a what if. But if they had intervened at that moment in time when German strength was at its maximum, I really can't see how... I think the Turkish would have gone... You know, the Turkish state would have gone the way of every other Eastern European state, really. Uh, they just would have got conquered by somebody, uh, either the Soviets or the British or the Americans. Or so. Somebody would have conquered them because there's no... They can't survive against... You know, if they, if they ally with the, the British or the Soviets... Then you've you've got then you've got the Axis who could possibly invade. I don't know. It, it just doesn't. They they. I don't think, given the situation after World War One, that they they could have survived if they had invented the war. And I think, yeah, that they may have joined the Axis, but it's a, in a lot of ways it's a good job they didn't because they would have got slaughtered after Stalingrad. So, uh, hmm. uh, could it have could it have impacted the campaign? I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. I don't... Could they have reforged the Ottoman Empire in the Middle East? Maybe. But again, the British have already got the Ninth Army. I think it's the Ninth Army in northern Iraq. I, I just can't see it happening. Uh, not with the Americans by that point. So, no. 